So the agenda for today's webinar, I will give a quick, uh, quick overview of IRENA. Uh, I will then introduce our panelists for today. Um, they will give their presentations. Following that, we will have a question and answer period. And then we will have a quick feedback session where we will share with you a short poll um, to get your feedback on this webinar. So for those of you that aren't aware, IRENA is the International Renewable Energy Agency. We are an intergovernmental organization that support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future. We currently have 132 member states around the world and 37 states in accession. And our role as an organization is to serve as a center of excellence and a repository for, pos for policy technology and financial knowledge on renewable energy. One of the many projects of IRENA is the IRENA Renewable Energy Learning Partnership, which hosts the IRENA, sorry, which hosts the IRENA webinar series. If you're interested to know more about uh, other webinars that we offer, you can go to our website, www.irena.org slash IRELB, and subscribe to our newsletter. And you can also find many other resources and tools for education uh, in the renewable energy sector. So we have over 3,000 courses, webinars, training guides, and internship opportunities uh, within our website. I also encourage you to join the IRENA community uh, by going to www.irena.org slash community. The IRENA community is an open platform where people can ask questions, share ideas, and start debate about renewable energy topics. And today we will use the IRENA community to follow up uh, to the discussions from this webinar. And if you have questions that you aren't able to ask during the webinar, we encourage you to go to the community and you can do that by visiting the link provided. You will need to register, as you see in the top red box. And on the bottom right uh, corner of your screen, you will see a featured topic. And this is where we will be continuing the discussion on the webinar. And our panelists will be available there to answer any questions you might have. So without further ado, I will introduce our panelists for today. Our first speaker will be Mr. Ambika Adhikari. He is a program manager uh, at the Office of Knowledge Enterprise uh, Development at Arizona State University. He manages the Vogue Tech program. Uh, he's also a senior sustainability scientist at ASU's Global Institute of Sustainability and a faculty associate in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. Our next speaker will be Rim Razuk. She is a senior instructional designer at Arizona State University. In her current position, she leads the curriculum development and assessment and evaluation process for the Vogue Tech program. And our final speaker will be Elham Taleb. Uh, she currently works for IRENA in designing and implementing capacity building programs to assist developing countries in their transition to renewable energy futures. Uh, among her projects, uh, she is working on a certification scheme of solar PV installers where she co has coordinated a multi-stakeholder partnership to implement a quality standard-based certification of solar PV installers. And, and I will now pass the floor to my colleague Ambika. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Stephanie, thank you so much for that introduction. And it's my pleasure to be participating in this webinar. The topic today that myself and Dr. Razuk, who is my colleague, will be presenting is an introduction to the vocational training and education for clean energy program called VOCTEC. Uh, my name is Ambika Adhikari, and I manage the program as Stephanie introduced me. And the presentation today is uh, uh, oh, there are four objectives of the presentation that between myself and Dr. Razuk will be presenting to you. We'll be introducing the Boktek program to you, its background, the objectives, the partners that we have, the types of training that we offer, and the training components. We would also highlight for you the Boktek training workshops already done and some in planning, and we'll summarize some of the ones that uh, we are undertaking right now. 
we will introduce the assessment and evaluation system that we use as a university of the training and then eventually at the end we'll discuss the applicability of the program, the lessons that we learn and what our future program so that it could also be useful to you. So part one, there are total four parts in this presentation today. I will be presenting the part one and two. Dr. Razuk will be presenting part three and four. The part one is the basic introduction and the objective. The vocational program, the, uh, the vocational training and education in clean energy was conceived just because many of the investments that we make in clean energy systems all across the world oftentimes fail not because of the bad investment but because of the lack of capacity in the local community to maintain and operate these programs. So that was the basic motivation that we need to build the human capacity. So following that, the objective of the Tech program is to build awareness, knowledge and capacity of the local stakeholders in developing countries and to sustain renewable energy system investments so that any program where there's an investment done, there's going to be enough people with uh, information, technology and skills to continue to maintain the program and run to the best of their levels. We have many, many program partners in this particular system. The partners are government institutions like USAID. The basic program of the VOCTEC is mainly funded by the United States Agency for International Development. I'll go into a little bit of detail on that later on. We have also have a supplementary support from the New Zealand government through the New Zealand Foreign Affairs and Trade Ministry, New Zealand MPAT. And obviously, we are very honored and privileged to work with IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. I will discuss a little bit of that later on. We also, in this Tech program, we also have a project with the Inter-American Development Bank. These are only some of the examples that I am providing to you. We have industry partners like the Green Empowerment, which are on partners in training into the micro programs. The Dutch uh, NGO, TNO Innovation, the Titratech, one of the larger American, American uh, consulting companies, and obviously our own Arizona State University, which leads all this work tech program, works with Appalachian State University in North Carolina and the University of the South Pacific, which is a regional hub of our training, which is based in Suva in the Pacific. So what is work tech? Work tech essentially consists of three different types of technology and three different training levels. So we have a matrix of actually nine permutation and combination. The three renewable energy technologies that Boktek uses are solar photovoltaic, micro hydro and small wind and I'll go into a little bit of detail on that later on. All of them are the solar photovoltaic is only off grid, the micro hydro can be either and small wind. And in each of the, these three technologies we have three different training levels that we call level 3, level 2 and level 1, L3, L2 and L1. The L3 is the workshop that we do basically between one to three days to policy and decision makers so that people have the skills, information and database to make a decision on what kind of renewable energy technology is most suitable for their particular community, for their particular society, country and the region. The L2 which is the training for educators and engineers that follows the train the trainer module, model is the crux and the core of this book tech program. That's what really gets all this program running. In other words, we train the educators themselves and leave them in their community so that they can continue to train the workforce, the L1 level technicians. In our program, we make sure that we also start when we go to a particular community to train. After we train the educators, we also support them in the initial training of the technicians so that they can be on their own after a while. So, so those are the three levels on the three types of technologies. So what are some of the objectives and components of the VOCTEC program, the Vocational Training and, <clears throat> and uh, Education for Clean Energy? Essentially, the idea of the training is to build an infrastructure. So 
we try to, wherever we go with our partners, we try to create the lab, the laboratory and the equipments and also provide, I will go, I have a, a, a new slide later on about the mobile training toolkits which is an independent, self-standing and complete off-the-box training material for the solar PV. And this is established through the curriculum and certification program that are mandated and created for a specific place so that that particular curriculum, whether it is in microhydro, whether it is in solar PV or on the wind, is completely fitted to a particular location and contextualized with the curriculum and so on. And with those kind of infrastructure and the curriculum which uh, constitutes the manual and so many other elements, we build a human capacity. Like I said, we train policymakers, educators and technical workforce. The middle educators are the key and the foundations and the main pillar of the Voktek program. The, it's not only a technical training, it also has entrepreneurship, communication, teaching and gender elements incorporated into all of the training. As a university, we want to make sure that all those elements are completely taken care of. It's not only technology, it's not only technicians, it is all those that make that program sustainable. People have to establish the business through entrepreneurship, they have to be able to communicate what they're doing, they have to be able to understand how to tease and obviously gender is extremely important. Having role from the female and male both sides is extremely important to sustain any clean energy investment. Then as a university we not only just train, we assess and evaluate both in the short term just to see the impact and also the long term timeline, the longitudinal impact of what we do and what remains after we leave in the program. To support all of the programs that I just described, we implement what we call the VLE, a virtual learning environment that resides within the ASU's computer and it is accessible to all our alumni of the training into the, uh, uh, the program. They can create an account and they can get into a program and, and then continue to learn and discuss. So let me go spend a minute on the mobile training toolkits which is one of the important innovations that we have found and we have uh, uh, created for this particular program. It is a box which is about 65 kilos, about three and a half feet by two and a half feet, 18 inch to two feet uh, uh, depth. Uh, you can roll it, it's a strong box, uh, you can take it with you. It has 33 different components of the solar PV that can give you a complete solar PV technology right there to train. It can train up to six people. So you can carry it to a remote area, establish with the solar panel, the charge controllers, the batteries, uh, the all kinds of wiring and equipments and inverters, you can make a complete system. If you assemble and disassemble, disassemble and show it to the educators, uh, they have a, uh, a pretty uh, full understanding of how to go for the training on the solar photovoltaic. So this is one of the very popular elements that we've been giving to all the different institutions, about 13, 14 different institutions that we work right now. We give them free of cost, courtesy of the USAID, three is to each one of them and they have been tested for each particular locality. Right now we have a big program in Fiji and we give three each to any of the 11 partners that we have. On the part two, let me talk a little bit about the training workshop and the projects. We have a portfolio which is uh, pretty mixed. Here is an example. The largest, of course, is the USAID, which is supplemented by the New Zealand Impact Money. We do photovoltaic, microhydro, small wind all across the world. So we have programs in the Pacific, in Africa, India, and we are also planning to expand the program in other places. And then we work with TNO, as I mentioned before, the University of Virgin Islands. Then we have programs in Ghana, in Kumasi Polytechnic, and also with Inter-American Development Bank in Barbados, Jamaica, and Trinidad, Tobago. And obviously, we are very privileged again to work with IRENA. We have three different programs with them on entrepreneurship, photovoltaic certifications, and online community learnings. So here are some highlights of what we do. The technician training that we completed very recently in 2012 was in Aruba. We have about 30 people trained, and those numbers will be given by Dr. Rozuk in a while, in Suba for the solar educator who have already begun to train other people. 
and then the technician training that we've been supporting in Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, and Tonga, and many other different countries. In Liberia, we recently completed a microhydro technician for about 20 people or training. And 10 different countries in the Pacific, we have the technician training in the solar PVs that are ongoing. For example, Samoa, Kiribati, Marsala Lines, and so on. With IRENA, I mentioned we have three different programs. We completed one entrepreneurship training to help people establish their own businesses in Vanuatu and Solomon Islands. The West Africa Solar Technician Training in four different countries, five different countries is ongoing right now. That will help them build a certification program just like NAFSIP, the North American Board for Certified Energy Professionals that we use in US and Canada. The IRELP, which Stephanie described earlier, the knowledge advisory that Arizona State University is helping IRENA on the IRELP project also. The Inter-American Development Bank project that uh, we are working on the three different countries of Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad Tobago also likes to build the capacity and sustainable energy con communication and information. So it kind of really jives with the BOPTEC program that we are doing right now. With this, I'm going to give it to my colleague, Dr. Raju, to uh, speak on part three and part four. And uh, we will be coming back later on for any questions and answers. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, I have the pleasure to be participating in this webinar uh, today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, again, my name is uh, Rim Razouk and I'm the Senior Instructional Designer on uh, the BOFTEC program. Um, in the coming two uh, parts of this presentation, I'm going to talk briefly about the assessment and the evaluation process and accomplishments, the applicability of the program, of BOFTEC program, some lessons learned that uh, we, uh, we've learned uh, from the training and uh, some future plans. Uh, the assessment and evaluation process uh, is uh, usually an important part of uh, any training program, not only because um, it provides feedback on the trainees', trainees performance and uh, learning uh, and the effectiveness of the instructions, but also because the insights gained from the data and from the, um, from the trainees themselves allow us uh, to improve the current uh, program and the future training as well. The assessment and the evaluation framework that we've been using, um, as you can see in this uh, figure, is adapted from the Kirkpatrick evaluation model, which actually includes um, four measurement areas. The reaction, uh, which is uh, the participant's perception of and satisfaction with the design and delivery of the training program, the learning, uh, which is the extent to which the participants acquire new knowledge um, or learn new knowledge and skills. Uh, the third measure is behavior, which is the uh, confidence or perception of the participants um, and their ability to apply the newly learned knowledge and skills after they receive the training. Uh, the fourth measure is the impact, which is actually the long-term, the evaluation of the long-term impact of the training uh, on the trainee's knowledge acquisition and application of skills, and also uh, their attitude toward the training um, after a couple of months. We usually do, we've been doing this only with um, the educators, which is the L2 training, and that's because those are the people we are actually able uh, to um, we have access to and we are able to reach within six to eight months after the training takes place. Uh, so those are the four uh, four measures. Uh, for um, for the reaction measure, the area of evaluation, as I mentioned before, is uh, related to the perceptions, uh, which is attitudes. So in order to uh, measure this. 
we've been using attitudinal surveys that allow us to collect quantitative and qualitative data. With respect to learning, uh, we have four areas of evaluation. Three related to content, non-technical content, as Ambika mentioned before, and this includes uh, might include topics like gender, awareness, um, entrepreneurship skills, teaching strategies and methodologies, advanced content, uh, technical content, which is related to technicians, and the hands-on activities that the, the technicians perform using the mobile training toolkit that uh, also Ambika introduced. Uh, for the three content areas, we use um, uh, as the measurement tools pre- and post-knowledge assessments. And for the hands-on activities, uh, we've been uh, also using uh, hands-on evaluation forms that allow us to uh, collect, again, quantitative and qualitative data. Why we've been applying the um, pre-assessments, the objective of using the pre-assessment um, in the beginning before any training is delivered is to determine the part participant's um, uh, knowledge level uh, before, uh, prior to the delivery of the training content. And in turn, we will be able to compare uh, uh, between uh, the pre and the post data, which allows us to determine the change in, um, in learning uh, by the end of the training. Uh, with respect to behavior, again, we're measuring the area of evaluation here is attitudes and the confidence of the um, trainees in their ability uh, to apply the, the knowledge and skills that they've learned. Uh, we, we, uh, we've been using attitudinal survey. And for the fourth um, measure, uh, impact, uh, we've been measuring um, after six to eight months uh, um, after the training, we've been measuring the long-term knowledge acquisition in addition to attitudes toward the training. And um, to measure these, we've been using knowledge assessments and attitudinal surveys as well. Um, this is a snapshot about some of the training statistics. So, so far, we trained uh, 135 technicians. Uh, we have um, a plan for this year to train 130 technicians. Uh, some, um, some of these tra training have been already taking place. So, um, Maybe out of these 130 so far within the last month, we've trained already like 30 technicians additional. Uh, 33 ed educators have uh, been also trained. 25 are planned to um, be trained this year. Again, a training been taking place actually last week um, uh, to train additional couple educators. 32 policymakers um, been trained too, and 15 are planned to be trained uh, this year and 20 entrepreneurs um, been trained so far. Uh, this table actually shows a, a snapshot of the training results with respect to um, different uh, trainings that we've done so far um, uh, that are funded by uh, USAID uh, or, uh, and IRENA. Uh, for trainers, um, trainers in the training for Pacific uh, in the Pacific for the solar photovoltaic. Um, we had 94% of the trainees were male and 5, uh, 6% were female. And as you can see from the table, um, in almost all the trainings, we had high increase in knowledge, um, a high satisfaction uh, with respect to reaction on a scale of 5 points, 5 being the highest. And with respect to behavior, which is, again, the confidence in their ability to perform the skills learned, um, uh, again, high average in, um, in all uh, the, the trainings. Um, and the first one, which is the L2 training, we can see that uh, when we apply the impact, we, um, the results show that the learning was maintained even after six months from the training, and the positive behavior also was maintained. And those, train, uh, those educators, in turn, trained uh, around 140 technicians uh, through their institutions. Um, again, the, the, second, the second row actually shows the technician training uh, in the Pacific for solar PV and technician training and microhydro that happened in Liberia. Again, very high um, satisfaction with the, with the training 
and confidence and ability and a high increase in um, knowledge from uh, pre to post um, post assessment. Um, with respect to the IRENA entrepreneurship training, we had 75% of, of the participants were female, 25% were male. Again, very high, um, very high satisfaction and very high confidence and 20% increase in um, learning. Uh, for some of you, uh, you might think that 20% increase is a law. Uh, you might be wondering why, why um, we only had 20% 20, 20 or this level, this percentage is actually low with respect to all the other trainings. Well, actually, it is worth mentioning that those trainees entered uh, were mainly uh, either entrepreneurs or um, have very high level of education with respect to uh, solar energy. So uh, the pre-assessment actually indicated that they already had and the background surveys already indicated that they already had a very high um, prerequisite skills uh, from before the training, which means 20% increase um, after the training still achieved. This is a very high uh, percentage. Now I will, be, uh, I will uh, briefly talk about the applicability of the VOCTEC program, um, lessons learned throughout the, the trainings and uh, some future plans. The VOCTEC program is uh, applicable to many regions and um, countries because it provides customized and localized training services in um, different areas. Uh, VOCTEC is not only limited to um, providing technical material, as Ambita was saying before, however, it incorporates um, non-technical content, such as um, gender under um, awareness and social awareness, in addition to uh, providing supporting tools, assessment, uh, assessments um, and measurements, and virtual learning platform. It's also worth mentioning that we also provide the um, educators, when we train them, with all of the uh, technician um, material and content, in addition to templates, supporting materials, all the activities they need and the assessments that actually allow them to modify and customize the curriculum as needed to meet the needs of their uh, trainees or even to create um, their own new modules using those templates and following, um, following the, the templates. Um, this figure actually shows uh, the, the components that go into um, VOCTEC. So VOCTEC includes um, a technical and non-technical material, as we mentioned before, like social awareness and gender inclusion. It also includes um, the provide the online uh, platform, which is a virtual learning uh, environment. Uh, that is a, a um, comprehensive online learning collaboration and, and uh, dissemination platform uh, that promotes um, best practices. Um, and that includes discussion forums and uh, content repository for the educators. Um, VOCTEC also provides um, provide games that reinforce specific important skills. Uh, for example, uh, troubleshooting of a solar PV system. We have games for troubleshooting a solar PV system or sizing a solar PV system just to reinforce the skills taught. And it also provides uh, supporting materials such as the end user poster uh, that the technicians can, um, that the educators can give with, for the technicians and then in turn the technicians can use in order to educate the end users. Um, it also provides manuals and guidelines in addition to handbooks that elaborate, um, that include elaborated content and activities and finally assessment tools and um, measurements to assess and evaluate the outcome and the impact, um, impact of the trainings. Throughout the trainings, uh, we've learned lessons in many uh, areas, such as housing, budgeting, uh, planning and development, assessment, and logistics. These lessons are being applied to uh, continuously improve the VOCTEC program. I'll talk briefly 
uh, about each and provide uh, an example. So um, with respect to logistics and housing, we've learned that it's very important to ensure that logistics, transportations, and security issues are uh, properly organized for any site visits related to the training. We also learned that ensuring the, um, the availability of proper and adequate housing for the trainers and the trainees, the trainees within, um, within a reasonable distance from the training site um, is actually very crucial. Uh, with respect to budgeting and uh, cash funds, it is important to have adequate budget and to allocate um, enough time for shipping, ground transportation, customs, and local storage when, we, when shipping uh, training materials to, uh, to other countries. Also, having uh, cash funds available, um, available with you on hand for any unforeseen and immediate needs is very important. Detailed planning and development um, of any material in timely fashion to provide enough time for review. This is very important, especially when um, uh, we notice that this is very important, especially when we are collaborating with different subject matter experts to create the curriculum um, and approval is needed for content. Um, for us, it also appeared that it's uh, um, uh, more efficient if we uh, if we ask the educators in advance to uh, to create their accounts um, on the VLE to create their username and accounts on the VLE on the virtual learning environment because it saves time. Concerning the assessment and evaluation process, um, uh, it is very important to assign an assessment and evaluation liaison individual to administer and collect all the assessments and to make sure they are collected in the right order when needed and in order not to miss any of the assessments. Um, we also learned that establishing a quality review mechanism and process uh, for assessment is also very important since, um, since the subject matter experts need to approve um, the assessment items and we need to make sure that every assessment item is actually related to a specific learning objective and is uh, measuring a specific learning objective. Finally, uh, providing, um, we created step-by-step -step guidelines uh, to provide, to help the instructors who are actually collecting um, or administering the assessment. Because again, the order um, of the assessments um, can affect the reliability of the results. And um, this process is um, important to be well executed. Um, some of the ongoing and future uh, projects. Um, this is a snapshot of uh, some of the ongoing and future projects. Um, as Ambika mentioned before, we, uh, USAID, we have a couple of projects going on with USAID. We still have some uh, upcoming trainings uh, for technicians, uh, for educators, and policy makers in solar PV and microhydro. Uh, again, with IRENA, um, we are working on the, uh, we have with them uh, two projects now ongoing, the certification program in West Africa and um, the IRELT web uh, community that Ambika also talked about before. We have the uh, bridge renewable energy program in the Caribbean and the solar photovoltaic work workshop for the faculty in the University of Virgin Islands. Um, our, plans, um, our plans are to I keep expanding by taking on a new project and conducting more trainings on clean energy in different uh, countries. With, these, uh, with the following objectives in mind, um, increasing quality of people's lives, increasing work opportunities and sustainability, ensuring that the workforce possess, possesses the skills and techniques needed to design, install and maintain clean energy systems. 
And uh, last but not least, ensuring the ability of uh, trans uh, transferring the right skills for future generations. Finally, I'd like to thank you all for um, uh, participating in the webinar. Um, if you have any questions um, about uh, about VOCTEC that you think we can help with after the webinar is over, please don't hesitate to um, contact me or Ambika on um, our emails. Um, and now I hand the presentation to, uh, to Ilham. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rim and Ambika, for that excellent presentation. And now I pass the floor to my colleague, Ilham. You could go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for the previous introduction. And thank you very much uh, to Ambika and Rim uh, for the very informative presentation. First of all, I'd like to make sure that every, everyone can hear me clearly. <coughs> is, is, is yeah, everything yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Okay? Thanks. Okay. So, perfect. Okay, great. Um, it's really my pleasure to join you today. Um, I can see that we have quite a bit of, uh, a good number of attendees in the audience, so this is really great. Hi everyone, my name is Ilham Talab, and I hope that you will enjoy and actually benefit from the discussion um, next. So, today as the title of the presentation indicates, I'm going to be speaking about one of the capacity building projects of IRENA which is the certification program for solar PV installers. Basically, how do we build um, capacities of uh, solar PV installers to help sustain the growth of the industry? Now, the main objective of this presentation is to share with you our experiences here at AINA and um, also um, help to uh, get your feedback as well. Um, of course, this is only one of the projects of capacity building. We have many other projects and I hope that we will get the opportunity to also discuss them with you in future webinars. So the content of this presentation will start with the rationale, basically why we are doing this project, uh, what are the expected benefits uh, to the region and the member countries, and then moving forward to uh, describe some of the key terms, basically the terminology involved in a certification scheme. And then I will try to zoom out and give you the general picture of what to expect um, when we, we actually develop the infrastructure for an industry-based certification, just so that we don't get lost into the details. After that, we'll move uh, into the details by trying to ask 10 questions that we can consider or we should consider um, if we would like to uh, establish such a program. And then hopefully I'll have some time to go briefly and describe our experiences in the Pacific Islands and our plans for the future in West Africa. So basically, why are we uh, starting the regional industry-based certification and why are we in, in specific um, choosing solar PV as a technology to apply the certification to. Um, <clears throat> very simply answering the first question, um, of course when you do a certification program, uh, basically what you're doing is you're ensuring the quality of trainings that are being provided and at the same time you're avoiding the sporadic training, uh, sporadic uh, spread of training programs that really maybe do not add up and sometimes they waste resources more than they add value. If you notice in the title, the certification is actually industry-based. What we mean by that is that there is a market value for the trainings. Um, this means that the trainings will actually help the individuals to develop skills that actually respond to a specific market need um, and, and therefore it's much more probable they will find jobs in the market um, and, and that the training will be actually responding to a specific market need. Also having the certification um, on a regional level is very important because it allows for the mobility of the certified technicians within the region. 
Now, of course, this also could help to ensure that um, more jobs will be, um, or at least some jobs will be uh, available for these trainees. And it could also, we could argue that it could help minimize the uh, impact of brain drain. Of course, this is a very complicated and highly controversial issue, um, but uh, maybe just some food for thought. And Finally, of course, by establishing such a certification program, one would ensure the continuity of trainings, that these trainings are provided on a continuous basis and they're not a single-time intervention. And of course, this is much better in terms of the long-term impact um, of the trainings. Now, moving next to the second question, trying to see why did we select solar PV as a technology to start with uh, for the certification uh, program? Now, obviously, last year we have uh, seen um, that solar PV market hit a record, uh, as indicated by many reports, including the global status report, um, where it, uh, it, it indicated that more capacity has been installed by solar PV than any other technology, except perhaps for hydropower. The total installed capacity last year actually was up to 40 gigawatt, making the total global installed capacity reach up to 140 gigawatt. So, well, with the decline of prices, we know that this technology is going to continue to be um, uh, to be used on a very high um, um, high level. So, how do we sustain the growth of such technology? In order to do that, we minim in minimum in terms of quality and um, and capacity building, we need two things. The first one is quality uh, manufactured equipment which is a completely different story. Here we'll be talking about the standards for the equipment themselves, which is not the scope of this presentation. And the second component that we need is, is trained, and not only trained, but actually certified practitioners. In this case, we are talking about installers. So by this program, we aim and we hope to try to bridge the gap and try to contribute to building that um, uh, sort of um, uh, high level, high, highly skilled uh, uh, and human capacities that would actually um, help sustain the growth of the solar PV industry. Now, another important point is that by ensuring that the systems are being installed properly, we're actually enhancing the system performance. And this is um, very important. And actually, you'll be surprised to see to what extent would the uh, would this actually affect the system performance. Just a couple of weeks ago, I heard a story from my colleagues here that in, in in one of the countries they tested two systems, two PV systems. They were actually identical systems, and they tested them in the same area, but they were installed by two different installation teams, two different installers. And they found that the, the performance of the system varied by up to 20%. This is a huge percentage. So if we can really ensure that we are following the right standards, that we are installing the systems uh, properly, then of course the system performance will also be enhanced. And also um, customers are an important part of the equation which sometimes we kind of forget about. Um, and I'm sure that many of you maybe have even uh, experience this firsthand when you find, for example, in the off-grid sector where customers just lose confidence in the in the systems and then you have a, a, a considerable decline in the sales of the systems, not really because of market saturation, but because uh, the customer just lost the confidence in the system. So by, by basically uh, ensuring that the systems are installed properly, we can tackle this issue. And, um, of course, when you ensure that the systems are also installed properly, you sort of give an indirect guarantee to the financiers um, that would help lower their perceived risk and hence contribute to lowering the cost of financing. And finally, of course, by following the proper standards and guidelines, uh, we will make sure that the uh, safety procedures are being followed. Okay, so now we know why we are doing this project. I hope that you have a, a, a very good you know, understanding of the rationale behind it. I will move now to the second aspect, which is terminology. Now, this is quite important, and I really would like you to follow me here because um, it's very important that we are all on the same page. Um, some of you might know about this, so please bear with me if this is quite repetition for you. But I just selected five keywords that I thought constitute the core of any discussion on certification scheme. And without this, you will kind of, maybe you will know what does this mean, 
uh, in general, but you won't really distinguish between the different terms because there's a lot of commonalities between them. And actually, when I was trying to simplify the definitions, I found that um, they're actually interrelated. So when you define one, you must somehow use another one. It's like the chicken and egg problem. So I tried as much as possible to simplify the definitions and to list them in this particular order uh, to minimize this, um, this, this issue. So to start with, I'm going to start with two, uh, the first two, which is certification and accreditation. And as you can see, both of them uh, are quite similar. And in fact, uh, both of them, uh, some, many times they are used interchangeably, although this is not 100% accurate. Um, it's true that both certification and accreditation refer to the process by which a specific uh, subject of interest is being qualified by an objective evaluating body as having met a certain set of requirements. These requirements are usually referred to as standards. Uh, however, the difference between the two is that when you certify something, then your object, your, your subject of certification would be usually an individual. In this case, we're talking about um, solar PV installers. It could also be a product or a process or service, but that's not our discussion here. However, when you talk about accrediting something, then your target would be actually an institution. You would, you, we would accredit an institution or a training program or a course. And we see this in the education sector when we say, for example, that this university is accredited formally by this entity. So I hope that this distinction is clear. Now, um, when we talk about the certification matrix, um, these basically refer to the competency standards against which the person would be certified in our case. What we mean by this is what are the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, the tasks that this person, this installer, must, uh, must develop during the training so that we can assess him and at the end certify him or her. Um, the certification metrics are usually referred to as competency standards or job task analysis. In this presentation, I'm going to use stick to the term job task analysis to refer to these certification metrics. And just to give you another, like a much more clearer um, and simpler definition, basically this really simply just uh, describes the, the list of skills. What you have usually is a list of skills, um, many, many skills depending on the, the task or the technology that we're talking about. And these skills usually would have um, a ranking system. So in many of the times you have, for example, a three-level ranking system. Uh, for example, skill A would be either critical or very important or just important. And then based on that ranking system, you will um, assess the candidate for the certification and based on that you will certify the candidate. For example, in terms of installation of solar PV systems uh, for on-grid, for example, systems, one task could be Assemble modules, panels, and support structures as specified by module um, manufacturer or design. And the rank could be critical. So it's very critical for the installer to be able to assemble the modules and the panels and the support structure as specified by the design. OK, excellent. So now we have two more left, uh, standards and license. And standards basically, as the name indicates, these are definitions or, or frameworks. Um, that are really widely used and regularly used and agreed upon. Um, and the, the main objective of the standard is to really help achieve an optimum degree of order in a specific context. In our case, we are uh, interested in increasing or enhancing the optimum performance of solar PV modules. And uh, of course, this gets a little bit more complicated because sometimes you also have to consider the full system quality, which means that we're talking not only about the certification of individuals that will install your system according to standards, but also we're talking about the quality of service and also the quality of hardware. And this really becomes a much more deeper area. And I'd like just to um, note here that Irina is doing a lot of work in terms of uh, system quality and standardization for renewable energy technologies. Our colleagues are doing some work in this area. And uh, you can find a lot of more details in our website um, about this. But this is really not the subject of this uh, presentation. Now, licenses is the last uh, terminology term here, which 
I involved, uh, I, in, I involved in order to be able to indicate the difference between license and certification. They, there's a lot of commonality between them. Basically, they're both uh, a credential that is provided by an authority to an individual. But um, in terms of licensing, it has more of a, a legal and compulsory connotation. So it's, it's something like your driving license. Um, uh, something that you must do in order to be able to drive. So there is more focus on the legal connotation than on the skill connotation if you compare it to certification. Very good. So now we're done with terminology. I really hope that you grasp the differences between these terms because I'm going to be using them a lot in the coming slides. And um, to move forward, I will be now taking a step backward and before we, uh, we dive into the details, I would like to take a step backward and explain to you the general picture of setting an industry-based certification scheme. What does it really mean? What does it take to actually end up with a certified installer? And in order to do this, I found that the easiest way to do this is to move backwards. So please make sure that you understand that this flow diagram that I'm going to describe here, it's actually moving backwards. I'm going to start with things that we are much more familiar with and move step by step to the background details that we will then come, uh, come to in details in the next slides. So basically, in the picture that you see here to the, to the left side, it's a certified person, it's an installer that has been certified. What does it take to have this um, a certified installer? Of course, we would um, imagine that he must have taken a certification exam in order to be awarded um, with the uh, certification, um, with the certificate itself. Um, and this means that the person had attended a training program or a course. Now, in a kind of a simplistic form, we can say that this training course is based on inputs from three different components. We have the certified trainers, we have the uh, national or regional training provider, which is the institution that will provide the training, and we have the training material. Now, I'm going to go a little bit in detail into each one of them. The certified trainer, of course, uh, himself or herself needs to undertake a similar uh, full cycle uh, to get uh, to become certified, and this is um, and this is as simple as, as that. For the regional or national uh, training provider, um, in this case, this entity, this institution, will need to be accredited. And I hope now that you can under, uh, relate to the definitions that we just um, explained. So this institution, either national or regional level, will need to be accredited by an, uh, by an authority or uh, an accreditation body uh, on the national and on a regional level. And in the process, this accreditation process itself will need to follow international standards. So what do we mean by that? There are many international bodies that uh, provide guidelines of how such accreditation process needs to be conducted in order to make sure that all the different accreditation processes across the globe are actually harmonized. Now these institutions, I'm sure that many of you are aware of, for example, the ISO, the International Organization for Standardization. We also have IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, and we have the ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. So some of these institutions could be um, used to provide the, the international standards to um, uh, per perform this accreditation of this institution. Now, the training material. The training material, um, which is the, the course content, um, needs to follow certain um, job task analyses that we described before in the terminology. And just as a, as a backup, when we said that the job task analysis will list the skills that the installer need to acquire from the training, which means that the training program, the training material, the course, needs to be based on these skills. It needs to deliver these skills to the person. Um, now, uh, it's very important since we are talking about a regional certification program that these job task analyses be harmonized across the region. So how do we develop these job task analyses or these sets uh, of skills uh, that we need to 
uh, design our course uh, uh, based upon, how do we develop them and how do we harmonize them. This is the job of the technical committee that would actually sit at a regional level. Uh, which we call technical committee. And this technical committee would actually be uh, um, the function, the main function of this committee would be to design these uh, job task analyses and ensure that they are harmonized at a regional level. But the technical committee at the regional level gets its inputs, of course, as you might imagine, from the national um, uh, level. So we have representatives from each country that is involved in the regional certification um, and from each country we have actually representatives from a wide range of stakeholders from the government, from the private sector and from academia. And all of these uh, stakeholders they would provide their inputs to the regional technical committee in terms of what skills are needed uh, to uh, respond to the industry needs. Of course before everything we need to ensure that we have a political will and we have support and we have stakeholders that will actually champion the process. This is extremely important because without this it's very, very difficult to mobilize all of these actors to uh, uh, provide the financing required and to implement this. So I hope now by looking at this structure maybe you can, if you would like, go uh, uh, properly uh, backwards, the other way around, starting from the political world, the national level, regional level, and so on. And I really hope that you would grasp the bigger picture of what does it take to build a regional industry-based certification infrastructure. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to go uh, more into the details by actually um, saying, okay, now we know what is this all about. Um, how, do we, how do we do it? Where do we start from? Um, to answer this question, I'm giving you 10 questions that um, could be considered uh, by stakeholders if they would like to actually embark on such a program. And the first question is, why do you need a certification program? It's very important to identify the need and to validate the need because uh, this will help you really customize the program to your needs and it will help ensure that this is something demand driven from the country and from the region. And it's not an initiative that is dropped upon you and you have to deal with it. The second question is, is there a political buy-in for the uh, certification program? Um, it's not only important to ask this question, but it's also more important to try to investigate at what level do you have the political will. Is this political will at a national level or at a regional level? This is very important because in sometimes you actually would be surprised, but you would have a much more support at a regional level. You would have a strong regional entity that is 100% committed to develop this, and then it would make much more sense to start from the regional level and then mobilize actors at the national level. So, identify, so answering this question will help guide you to determine where to start from. The third question is, do you understand the terminology? As you saw, I just mentioned five key terms at the beginning of this presentation, and um, there are many, many other terms uh, if you go into the details of this, um, of this topic. It's very important that um, you understand the difference between the different technologies, and it's also a uh, different terminology, sorry, and it's also important to investigate if there is any difference in the meaning between um, uh, lo at the local level and at, inter uh, and at an international level. Um, this is sometimes the case and it would create some uh, confusion uh, within the process. It's very good to clear this at the beginning of the process. The fourth question is who are the relevant um, stakeholders? And this could be at the national, regional and the international level. Now there are there is a host of stakeholders and the list goes on but this is the main um, very important and critical ones that you must uh, get in touch with and you must mobilize. You have the government, the private sector, the academia, um, the uh, and, uh, certification and licensing and standards bodies in your country and region. You have the power utilities, of course, the financing community, um, development community, NGOs, and finally the consumers themselves. The fifth question is, who are the key actors that will support and who are the key actors that will oppose the certification? You might be surprised, although that this whole concept of certification sounds extremely 
um, uh, relevant and, and um, added value, but some small number uh, might actually voice concerns due to many reasons. And it's very important that you uh, consider this and try to mobilize them as well at a very early stage uh, of the process. And the sixth question is what components of the certification infrastructure that you do have exist already that you can build upon instead of starting from scratch. This is extremely important because it would make much more sense to start um, incrementally, build on what you have. Usually there is so much, so much um, going on in terms of trainings, in terms of certification, but it's really not um, homogenized. It's not really structured in a certain framework, whether on the national or the regional level. So it's very important to break down uh, the different components that you have and try to build upon it. For example, do you have uh, a, a large PV industry? Um, do you have an industry association? Um, do you have training programs for solar PV? Is there existing trainers locally? Um, and maybe do you have maybe you have other training programs? Not really. Uh, directly related to solar PV, for example, uh, electrical or mechanical trades. Um, is there any sort of certification related to solar PV? Um, it, do you have any bodies, whether on national or in, uh, regional level, that do accredit any training programs that you can start with? So these are key uh, considerations um, to help you start with what you have. The seventh question is, what are the planned PV-related projects in the short and long term? And of course, obviously, you must, must go through this exercise in order to uh, size your project and determine the scope of your project and the timeline. So that once you have your trainers, um, sorry, once you have your certified installers, um, it will hopefully coincide uh, uh, with uh, the uh, 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 launching of your project. So they would have some jobs for them. And uh, number eight is, who are the finance actors that could support the certification? This is a very important and critical question, and I will uh, talk a little bit more about it when I describe our experience in the Pacific Islands. The ninth question is, what administrative structure should you follow to develop the uh, framework of certification? This is, um, this is actually the core um, of the whole process, because what you need to build um, is is um, what we call a regional administrative body, uh, which is a group of representatives from a national uh, level. They uh, come together and they generate or they develop the regional administrative body. And the main task of this body is to host uh, different uh, committees. One of them will be the technical committee. And as I mentioned previously, the technical committee is responsible to develop the job task analyses the skills, the list of skills based on which the trainings will be uh, designed and uh, developed. So here you have actually two different options. You can, depending on which side is stronger, is it the regional side or the country national side? You can either start if you have a strong national, uh, regional uh, entity, you can start from the regional um, level and then go down and mobilize actors from the national level and identify those uh, representatives from the national level. On the other hand, uh, sometimes you really do not have such a strong regional entity and you need to start by mobilizing actors from each country and then they come together and they decide on how to design the regional administrative body and which regional entity the, the regional administrative body should sit within. And, um, uh, and because this entity will eventually become the legal representation of the whole program. They will provide um, a, a, an administrator, they will provide support staff, they will provide um, a host, they will actually host the uh, administrative body. So you must consider um, these different options depending on the context that you're dealing with and um, the strength levels between the regional and national levels. And finally, the Last question, number 10, is how will you ensure the sustainability and the relevance of the certification program, given that the technology evolves, meaning that you have new materials, new techniques, standards, and so on, and this eventually will mean that the skills required will also develop and change over time. So there must be some sort of an update mechanism, monitoring and evaluation 
platform to help you always be up to date with the needs of the industry, especially that we're talking about an industry-based certification program, which means that you have always to keep in mind the needs of the market. Okay, these are the 10 questions that um, we thought constitutes the basics, really basic uh, starting point for anyone who would like to consider and investigate uh, building such um, certification framework. And I'm going now to move forward to explain to you a little bit about our experience in the Pacific Islands and, um, and then in West Africa. So uh, in the Pacific Islands, basically, um, it's, it's a little bit different because when we get there, we found that they already have uh, many components of the infrastructure of certification already uh, developed by regional entities. So you have the CIAP, which is the Sustainable Energy Industry Association of the Pacific Island, and the Utility Association, which is the Power Pacific Association. Um, these two entities, in addition to the University of South Pacific and many other entities uh, in the region, have come together and have actually already uh, um, uh, or came up or uh, made up the uh, Regional uh, Technical Committee. And the Regional Technical Committee, as we said before, has already developed the technical standards for some um, technologies. So here we're talking about solar PV on-grid uh, certification scheme. And they're actually working or, as far as I know, have already completed the technical guidelines or the job task analysis for also of the off-grid sector. So, however, it, the whole program was actually dormant because there was no financing, there was no support, financial support to help drive the whole program. And this is a very important lesson because you can develop the whole program, there is no issue, but when it comes to implementing the trainings, um, you, there is a lot of cost associated with that, bringing the certified uh, uh, trainers, uh, bringing the, uh, the equipment to train on, uh, the training material, um, the, the cost of bringing everybody together in one place, and much, uh, and many other cost components that add up. And what happened in the Pacific that they couldn't actually drive the process because of the lack of funding. And what we did in IDENA, our role was basically to help kickstart this process by providing the needed fund. And we uh, got a very good response. So far we have over 50 trainees uh, enrolled from six islands. And as you can see, these are the islands uh, involved, Fiji, Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, Samoa, Tonga, and I cannot see the last one. I hope that you can see it in the presentation. Um, we have found that this uh, had given a very good response, and therefore we decided to launch um, a full-fledged certification scheme for technicians of solar PV in West Africa. Now, when we moved to West Africa, um, it's a little bit different because in West Africa there, there is no uh, infrastructure um, whatsoever. There is a lot of things happening here and there, but it's not uh, cohesively and coherently uh, coming together in a regional infrastructure. Um, and so what we're doing in Western Africa is really starting from scratch, developing the full program. This, this is very similar to the diagram that I went through um, in the previous slides. So uh, our partner here is the West African Economic and Monetary Union. And we're basically working with the five member countries, which also my colleague uh, Andika mentioned. And of course, this is a project that we are working with. Um, uh, in implementing this project, we're actually working with Arizona State University, um, our colleagues, uh, Ambika and Reem, and also uh, pioneer experts who actually were involved in setting the certification program for solar PV installers in North America, which is the NAFSEP uh, that also Ambika mentioned. Um, so we came together, all of us, and we are trying to gradually implement this the certification scheme in West Africa. You can see here the different spaces involved, um, basically starting from identifying a regional training provider uh, or a regional administrative body, in other words, that will uh, develop the job task analysis. Now, why regional? Because it happens that in West Africa, we have the West African Economic and Monetary Union, which is extremely 
uh, willing and supporting for and support uh, provides a lot of support for this initiative and it just makes sense because all of these countries that we are uh, working with the five member countries uh, Benin, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger and Senegal they have a lot of commonalities between them and in terms of um, uh, the training um, uh, the training context and it just makes sense to start on a, region, on a regional level. So we're starting on a regional level, level identifying the certification provider on a regional level, um, and then moving down to the national level, trying to find local universities, technical colleges, and vocational training centers that would actually prepare the training curricula based on the harmonized um, job task analyses that have been developed on a regional level. Okay, so I hope that you can see now the picture. And in the process, we will, of course, ensure that these training providers at the national level are being accredited by an, um, a, an, an agency at the national level, and so that they are, they are being um, recognized formally, basically accredited, and also that the whole process of establishing the certification scheme and qualifying these installers is um, accredited internationally. And this is what we mean by, um, uh, for example, the ISO IEC uh, 17024. This is one of the standards that tells you what are the steps uh, that you need to follow in order to make sure that the whole, whole process is harmonized um, uh, following certain guidelines. So basically everyone in the globe is following these guidelines. And so at the end of the day, the whole uh, certification process is harmonized globally. Uh, and this is basically having the international accreditation and the regional harmonization is what makes this uh, program very, very special and um, it's what constitutes the novelty for this program, these two components. Um, and the, in terms of the system sizes, I forgot to mention here that we're targeting small-scale applications for households and businesses of up to 10 um, kilowatt. Um, and basically, at the end of the presentation, I would like really to acknowledge our partners. As I mentioned, we're working quite closely with the Arizona State University, uh, with the Institute of Sustainable Power and Mr. Jack Werner, uh, Pacific Power Association, Sustainable Energy Industry Association of the Pacific, and finally in West Africa, the West African Economic and Monetary Union. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you uh, continue then you follow the presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I know that the topic is quite heavy and it involves lots of terminology, so thank you very much. Uh, these are the references and I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ilham, for that excellent presentation. So now we will have about 15 minutes for a question and answer. Um, and then uh, following that, we will have a short uh, survey for all of our viewers today. So uh, for questions to begin with, we had some people asking how they can access the slides following uh, the webinar. These are all currently available on the IRENA community. So if you go to www.irena.org slash community and under featured topics, you will find all of the presentations. They will also be made available on the IRENA website under the events archive um, on, the, on the homepage of IRENA. So our first question uh, was directed to ASU and uh, they're wondering how are the train, uh, trainees and institutions selected for the VOTEC program. So I'll hand the floor over to Ambika. Uh, first, and Rim, maybe you can add uh, as well. Yeah, Stephanie, thank you for that question. The, for the VOCTEC project, which is funded by USAID, in terms of selecting the institutions and places and trainees, there are certain criteria as we had agreed upon, but it basically depends on the demand for that training to be done. So, for example, in the 10 countries in the Pacific, we have 11 different partners. We initially went and did an assessment trip and looked at the demands and need for the training on how much renewable energy installation has taken place 
and how much is the need for people to really maintain and correct those. So that is the most important indicators of selecting the uh, uh, places. We have followed the same patterns in Kenya and India where we are doing the training right now. Now in terms of selecting the people whom we train, both in terms of educators and technicians, uh, the educators, we have some baseline guidelines on uh, how much experience they need and what kind of education that they need and we look into the sustainability and interest in the program. So for example, in the Pacific, we look for at least two years into the solar energy field and at least a basic engineering or a vocational uh, level education that they have already acquired so that we can go ahead and train them for two to three weeks and they in turn can continue to train the other people. Uh, I think that would uh, uh, take care of that question unless Sarim wants to add anything. No? Great. Thank you. You, you covered really aspect. Thank you, Ambika. Okay, and the next question was, I think, directed towards Irina, and they're wondering um, if Irina conducts follow-up trainings and if they do any assessment of previous training programs to ensure a continuous measurable impact. So I'll give the floor to Ilham. Thank you, um, Stephanie, and thank you for this question. This is a very good question, and of course, when uh, when we do our trainings, for example, in the Pacific, the program just started, so we have the trainees, uh, 52 trainees on board so far, uh, but they are still in the process of um, being trained and taking the courses to be eventually certified. What happens for the certification uh, program in specific is that there is a, they get a provisional uh, certification program. So they get a provisional certificate, they have to prove that they can uh, apply the skills that they have acquired through the training. So they have to actually bring a proof that they have installed an on-grid solar PV system um, and uh, properly and safely. Uh, once they provide this proof to the training organization, um, they get um, an, an actual full certification, which is valid for two or three years. I'm, I'm not quite sure of the number, I think for three years. And then after three years, they have to actually update their certification, so they have to um, uh, um, uh, attend um, an, an, a refresher course and then uh, again prove that they have used the, the, the knowledge and, and applied the skills and then they get uh, the new certificate. So this way we're trying to really ensure that we are uh, continuously monitoring the, um, uh, the level of skills and knowledge um, that we have imparted through the trainings. And for, for, for West Africa this is a very uh, the new project is actually in the very, very early stages and we will definitely follow something similar um, within the context of West Africa. I hope that this answered the question. Great, thank you, Elham. Um, this next question I think is uh, directed at all the panelists. Um, uh, someone is wondering what it takes to become a certified trainer for solar PV installation. So. Um, I guess, what, what are the criteria to become a certified trainer? Um, Ilham? Uh, okay, maybe I can take a sure. question. <laughs> it's, um, um, okay, this is what I was trying to, um, to explain by the, the, the flow chart uh, that I um, tried to explain moving backwards. What does it take to actually certify somebody? Of course, it depends from um, a region to a region. For example, in, in the Pacific, we have this uh, uh, scheme where if you are a technician, you have to register with the training provider and then you attend uh, an online course followed by a practical, uh, actual practical course. It's a four-day course where you actually uh, disassemble and assemble a solar PV system. And then you have to, uh, you will get a, a, a provisional certificate and then you, you, you provide a proof that you apply the knowledge and the skills and then you get the full certificate and so on. In, in, in North America, I think Ambika knows more about the system, the NAPSIP system there and how it is implemented. Um, basically, if I understood the, the, the question correctly, it depends because uh, the different regions, they adapt different um, uh, 
steps of how to become a certifier, what sorts of trainings, should you attend an online training first or is it all only a practical training and then a final exam and so on and so forth. Uh, but basically if I understood the question right, then um, you have to identify the training provider in your country or in your region. You have to identify these training providers, um, attend the courses, um, uh, at, uh, 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 attend the final exam and once you pass then you will get your certificate which could be a provisional certificate in, initially. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this uh, answers the question correctly. Thank you very much Ilham. Um, maybe Ambika or Rim if you have anything you would like to add to that. Ambika or Rem, would you like to add? Uh, yes, I, I can add just a couple things, Stephanie. Thank you for that. Uh, Ilham did a very good job of really explaining what it takes to be certified in solar technician or, or different levels of uh, solar technology. Uh, the Basically, the system is the same, but there are various levels of certification depending on the complexity. Like, for example, in Kenya, there is a level 1, level 2, and level 3. Here in NAPSIP also, there are many different refined calibrated levels, starting from something very simple, off-grid solar installation to more complex, higher level, utility level, uh, solar energy grid connection. So basically, one has to have a commensurate level of experience and education to start with, to sit in the, to, to work towards the certification. Uh, then, like uh, Ilham mentioned, you got to fulfill a particular number of courses that have been offered by accredited agencies, which have been accredited by the by the board that actually accredits the training agencies. And after that, after you fulfill all of that and make an application, you are able to, uh, you are able to sit in the exam. And then, depending on what level of certifications you are looking at, uh, that's where you will be examined. And then uh, you can go step by step. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ambika. Um, I think we'll have time maybe for just two more questions here. And uh, please don't forget that if your question wasn't answered, you can go onto the community and ask your question there. And um, our panelists will do their best to get back to you. Um, the next question I think is a quick one. Um, we have someone wondering if there will be any uh, plans for certification and and training for individuals or institutions in Nigeria. Um, so maybe Ilham and then Rimen and Bika. Um, yeah, for Nigeria. I mean, um, the project in West Africa, I'm not directly um, uh, involved with. Uh, my colleague uh, Juan Martinez is actually the project manager for the, for the project, but he's on leave and cannot uh, could not attend this presentation. But what I, um, as far as I know, that we're working with the five countries from um, from West Africa, from Yoruba, uh, and these are Benin, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Senegal. And um, after that. Um, Towards the end of the of the program, there is an a, an intention to um, expand the project to uh, uh, um, uh, to reach to the total number of uh, 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 members in West Africa Economic and Monetary Union. Um, and perhaps Ambika would actually know something more about this because he's also uh, part of the project manager for this project um, with Irina. Yes, Elam. I would be happy to <coughs> complement on that. Uh, obviously, IRENA program is focused on certain number of countries because in the beginning it's really difficult to have many, many countries together to have a regional certification program because the West Africa certification program is a regional program right now. It has started with certain countries with some basics like like uh, Ilham had mentioned before. Now Nigeria is a very big country, it's the largest country in Africa and there are a lot of uh, actually questions we also get at Arizona State University. Now the certification scheme that Irina was thinking was more from the regional perspective and then ASU itself is also actually thinking of some doing some regional perspective of 
uh, the the certification system in East Africa. So uh, there are two ways to do it. You can do it for a particular country, like uh, Kenya, for example, has already certain certificates and mechanism within the country. And Nigeria, being a very big country, can obviously have its own certification mandate. It has to initiate within Nigeria and people like IRENIA, IRENA or Arizona State University and other agencies can come and complement. The other possibility which uh, is more preferably, preferable in some ways like NAPSEP is between US and Canada, the North American Board <coughs> for Certified Energy Practitioners. And it has become such a good example that many other countries are also looking at it as a model or sometimes they actually even use the same standards like in Aruba and some places in, in uh, um, uh, in the Latin America. So if we come up with a very good and very solid certification system in West Africa, that can expand to other countries or Nigeria can actually adopt those roles uh, pretty easily. Uh, between US and Canada sometimes if US develops certain standards, Canada sometimes will adopt and vice versa. So there are many ways to cut it. You can have a regional system, you can have an in-country system. I do not know of anything very specific going on in Nigeria right now, but because many programs are going in Africa and Nigeria is a very big country with a lot of renewable energy, I do think if there's a local initiative, uh, there will be opportunities to have a certification program there. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Ambika. And I think we'll just take one more question. I'm sorry to those of you that don't get your questions answered now, but we'll do our best to follow up with you. Um, the last question is asking if there is any directory or repository of people who have been trained or certified through these programs. So Ambika, maybe you can answer first, and then Ilham, and then we will continue to do a quick for our viewers. Absolutely. So in terms of the certification, I will defer it to Ilham because we are only beginning the program. That is the first one that IRENA is doing in, in uh, West Africa. So we are just beginning the program, so we probably wouldn't have a registry, but Ilham probably has a plan. In terms of the training, the last two years, Arizona State University through USCID and other funding has been working with 10 different countries in the Pacific, like my, I mentioned before, with 11 different partners. We do maintain a registry of the people who have been trained, especially the educators that we have trained, the 30 educators that we have trained in the Pacific, the 16 educators that we are training right now in Kenya. We really keep a tab on them and the virtual learning environment that Reem was mentioning before is designed so that these educators can continue to chat, become a community, and then connect with each other and ASU who provides them a backup support. Because like I said, the Boptech program, the core of the program is those train the trainers, the trainers and educators that we train. So we do maintain the list of those people, which is not exactly public right now, but uh, eventually when people are more interested, I think uh, they can be approached by other people also. Ilham, you want to add anything on certification? Yeah, yes, thank you very much, Ambika. Uh, regarding the certification, as Ambika said, for West Africa, this is a, this is a, a very new project. It's at the very uh, beginning, um, very, very early stages. But however, for um, the Pacific Islands, uh, we have so far, as I mentioned, over 50 installers enrolled, which means that not all of them have actually completed the certification, um, uh, uh, the trainings, and got the certification process. But what is in our plan is, is to uh, create a group within the IRENA community, and this is maybe a very good uh, chance for me as well to reiterate what uh, my colleague Stephanie mentioned at the beginning of this presentation when she uh, um, directed you to the IRENA community, which you can find it on IRENA.org. And within this community, we would like to create groups, um, online groups that could be also public, uh, which includes these as installed, uh, sorry, these certified uh, installers. This would be a very good opportunity for them to stay in touch, to um, uh, for IRENA also to stay in touch with them, and for the outside community to get to contact them exchange knowledge and information and um, and just build a very uh, active and vibrant network. This is not a very easy task to do, but we are aware of this and the importance of this. And one of our plans is basically to create um, a group within the IRENA community, within IREP, uh, that will help to maintain the network active as much as possible. But this hasn't been done 
so far because the certification scheme in the Pacific has not completed yet and uh, for West Africa it is at the very beginning stages and as I mentioned in West Africa it's a whole framework that we're trying to build uh, so that will take actually a couple of years until we are able to uh, to build such a network but thank you very much because this is a very excellent and important point. Okay, thank you very much, Ilham. So finally, we will just uh, launch a poll. You should see this pop up on your screen. Uh, there are three questions that we would like if you could answer for us. So the first one is uh, the webinar provided useful information and insight. Okay, thank you. And the second question was, uh, the webinar presenters were effective. Okay, thank you. And the last question was, overall, the webinar met my expectations. Great, thank you very much. So I would just like to say thank you from Irina for attending uh, this webinar. Uh, I'd just like to remind you once more that if you have any questions uh, following the webinar, to please ask these in the forum on the Irina community. And if you are interested in joining other Irina webinars, uh, please visit the IRELP website, www.irena.org slash IRELP, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, I'd like to just open the floor to our panelists, Ambika, uh, Ilham, and Rim, to see if you would like to make any closing remarks. So, Ambika, if you'd like to add anything. Stephanie and, and Rim and Ilham, it was a wonderful opportunity to be able to present and also describe the BookTech program and also our collaboration with Irina. We are extremely happy to be working with you, and uh, we are very happy to be sharing information on what we do to the, the global community and especially the lesson learned uh, that we have seen. Uh, hopefully that will be of use to other people. We really appreciate these opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Rim, if you'd like to add anything. Sure. Um, same thing, like Ambika said, I'd like to, um, uh, to thank you all for attending the um, webinar. Thank you, Stephanie, Yelham, and Ambika also for uh, great presentations. Um, and it was uh, really my pleasure to participate in this webinar. I hope that everyone um, found it beneficial and uh, informative. And um, uh, please don't hesitate to post your questions on IRELP or even email us uh, directly if you have any questions that you think we can help with. Thank you very much, and have a great day or evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rim and Ilham. Any closing remarks? Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rim and uh, Ambika, for the very informative presentations on the ASU activities. From my side, I was really very happy and pleased to join you, and I hope that the audience has benefited and learned something new, and actually, um, this is a very good opportunity for us as well to share our activities, and I hope that we will get uh, future opportunities to present other projects that we are carrying at ARENA. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I would be very happy to answer any questions you have. 
through the audit community or directly via email. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you to all of our uh, panelists very much for all this useful information. And thank you to all of the attendees today. Um, I will now close the webinar.